When you are sick for no reason, nobody believes you because they don't believe in magic and miracles, and they don't believe in curses either. To the medical community, being undiagnosed is effectively equivalent to being cured. If the doctors don't know what you have, you might as well not have it. My confusing mess of symptoms began when I was about 10 and steadily got worse throughout my adolescence. My chronic illness looked like allergies, but all the tests came back negative. It felt like a cold, but the symptoms didn't quite match. My joints were swollen, my skin was popping with welts and hives, my chest was filled with phlegm, I could never stop sneezing. And doctors would just call me an enigma and send me on my way. By the time I was a freshman in high school, I was missing around a week of school every month because of this chronic illness. At one point, I had seven specialists on my case, from allergists to immunologists, even psychiatrists, because it had been suggested that since there was no apparent reason for this, it was all in my head. Despite multiple tests, visits to so many subspecialists, no one could figure out what was wrong with me. No one could give my illness a name. No one could figure it out. And so we began to conclude it must not exist. An unnamed, misdiagnosed, misunderstood mess of symptoms with no pre-existing nomenclature grants you no innate sympathy. Because if no one knows what to call it, why should anyone care? My high school certainly didn't seem to care. Despite my parents and even some of my doctors advocating for them to accommodate my absences, the school kept avoiding the topic. At meetings, they evaded the idea of helping me, suggesting that I was just anxious or depressed like many other teenagers. The administration highly recommended that I drop some of my advanced placement classes because they were causing the overwhelming stress that was at the root of my problems. It was impossible for me to insist that my illness was valid with somatic symptoms because no one knew what it was. The doctors and the school administration didn't understand it, so they concluded I must be faking my sickness. My parents, who lived with me and saw the effects that this was having on me day to day, were dedicated to helping me. But after so long, and with no proof, there was very little they could do to convince the administration and the doctors that this was legitimate. I had this infuriating and long-lasting experience dealing with my school's administration, which couldn't accept that I was legitimate without a diagnosis, and with my doctors, who either declared my symptoms impossible when I described them, or just said that I was an unsolvable case. And while all of that was upsetting and discouraging, the most jarring part of this whole experience actually came later, once everything was actually getting better. A little less than a year ago, I was 16 years old. I had a fabulous allergist who finally had an innovative idea as to what might be wrong with me. And she ordered a blood test, which subsequently finally diagnosed me with evolving lupus, the preliminary diagnosis to lupus, an autoimmune disorder that's related to arthritis and fibromyalgia. I was ecstatic at this news. It meant I wasn't crazy. I had a real condition. I wasn't depressed. There was something wrong inside of my body, something in my blood, and suddenly everything made sense. The rashes, the fatigue, even the anxiety all supported the thesis that I was afflicted with something resembling this disease, which affects more than 200,000 people, mostly women of Jewish or African descent in the United States. Lupus is a complex disease, and there is no cure for it, but having the diagnosis was incredibly affirming for me and for my family. But then I told the school, and their response both thrilled and terrified me. The second they saw the signature from my rheumatologist, my lupus doctor, and the second they heard the news that this was a legitimate disorder, they offered me more accommodations than I knew were possible. They let me take classes online, an option that they'd never presented before. They encouraged me to pursue high classes instead of drop them. They said they would do whatever they could to help me. Of course, I was very happy to have their sympathy and understanding, but I was also profoundly bothered by this development because I was just as sick the day before the diagnosis as I was the day after. The day before, nobody cared, and the day after, everyone felt sorry for me. 
going through this and seeing the reactions of the medical and educational communities on my mystery illness has made me realize that there is a profound issue with the way we deal with mysteries in our lives. In medicine and in education, it is frowned upon to admit not knowing when it should be encouraged. And we as students can make that happen by being honest and open with authority figures in our lives. Administrators and teachers need to know what's going on. Even when it's scary, we need to tell them the truth. And we as patients can express ourselves to doctors in ways that go beyond dehumanized symptoms to make ourselves real and accessible. I saw dozens of doctors afraid to recognize the validity of something that they didn't understand. I saw teachers and counselors nervous about accommodating a student who could not prove her illness was real. I felt compelled to share my story today because it is so clear to me, after living through an experience like this, that ego and unease are getting in the way of encouraging youth to flourish. It sounds like an admittance of failure for a doctor to declare a case too much for them. It feels wrong to accommodate a student who can't prove that her illness is real. But fear cannot hold back the potential and the spirit of someone who wants to be successful. At every pediatrician's office, in every school nurse's clinic, we need to be cultivating a culture of acceptance rather than one of skepticism. We are so scared to say, I don't know, that we decide that things beyond our understanding are unreal rather than merely unexplainable for the moment. I think that the way we not only educate students, but their educators, needs a shift in worldview. But that isn't as drastic as it sounds. In fact, it could be easy. All we need is awareness and stories like this story to spread around our communities. We live close to some of the greatest hospitals in the country and in a thriving school district, and these places can set fantastic examples. I have a great hope that, via communication and awareness among students and their teachers, as well as patients and their doctors, we can change the way we look at illness, specifically illness that might be hard to diagnose. With my doctors, I try to be as honest as possible because it isn't just about symptoms, it's about a full experience. And I think that students and patients can make a great change for themselves and others by telling their whole stories, telling all of their pain. And I am lucky. I have parents who supported me wholeheartedly through all of this. I have a school that, while certainly disappointing in some of their earlier actions, really did strive to help me. I have medical insurance. I have the ability to visit highly qualified and experienced doctors. All of my privilege that helped me reach this point is not a universal guarantee. And it saddens me greatly that were I lacking just a single bit of the help that I got, I probably wouldn't make it, be making it through high school. It's tragic that there are others in the same situation I was in last year, unable to convince authority that they are legitimate. Being sick is draining. It is reducing. As a student, it enslaves you to the education system, making every absence induced by genuine unhealthiness punctuated by anxiety about the aftermath. The way that schools deal with chronically ill students needs reforming. My school told me that I was the first student with anything resembling lupus to attend. And while that might be true, the fact that they had no procedure to follow when it came to accommodating a chronically ill student was really upsetting to me. I understand that an autoimmune disorder isn't the sort of thing you think about unless you or someone close to you has it. I understand that an undiagnosed illness might seem inconsequential when it's non-fatal. However, there is clearly something lacking in both medicine and education that could help people like me. Recognition. Dismissal is more devastating than diagnosis, and throughout my entire adolescence, as I grappled with my sickness, the fact that I was barely believed made it so much worse. So don't be afraid to say you don't get it. Don't be skittish around things you don't understand. Be honest and real with authority figures in your life. If you are a student, assume kindness from your teachers and administration until you have proof that that's not going to happen. If you are true and expressive, you can change minds. If someone is struggling, assume validity until proven otherwise, not the other way around. Trust. Believe. 
Ignorance is not synonymous with shame. Just because we haven't mapped the universe doesn't mean it's not there. Just because my immune system is broken doesn't mean that I am. I have learned that I am not sick for no reason. I am sick because it's who I am. We can all accept that. Thank you.